So I feel like a Monty Python sketch or something. And now for something completely different. So I'm going to talk about something that has nothing to do with everything you've been hearing about. <coughs> and it mostly has to do with um, inspiring young women to become engineers. Yep. Okay. Um, there we go. Just have to point it in the right direction. So as Vanderlei said, I was a student of Dan's for most of the 1980s, and I worked on cavity quantum electrodynamics, so it was really nice to hear Sarah Charos kind of run through a little summary of that whole field. And after I got my PhD, I worked in industry for a little over 10 years, and then I came back to MIT as an instructor in mechanical engineering, uh, although I'm a physicist. So the class I teach, which I'm not going to spend too much time on, but the class is called 2.671. This is MIT, so everything has a number, including the buildings and the classes. It's basically the junior lab for mechanical engineers. They do experiments in lab, and then we also have a project we call Go Forth and Measure, where they pick something they're interested in and spend the semester working on it. And uh, they can do, they often do sports-related topics because they like those. They do topics looking at how sound insulation works in a dorm. They often do cooking topics, looking at how the moisture in cake depends on different levels of ingredients. And we try to get them to do some interesting techniques for you, transforms, co um, correlation functions, system identification, and sort of a one project that they develop from beginning to end. And at the end, they give a uh, poster session. And Dan has kindly come to many of the poster sessions. It's, they love having professors come and talk to them about their projects. And they also write a paper. And communication in my class is key. So we do a lot of oral presentations, papers, poster session. And I think you'll hear a little more from Rick Freeman about the importance of communication right after me. <laughs> so for a short digression, I discovered when I first came to MIT that actually engineers and physicists do think differently. Even though as an experimental physicist, you spend a lot of your time doing what is essentially mechanical engineering as you try to build your equipment. This is a picture of what I spent much of my life on. This one is better. So this is a cavity, which I used for my experiments. They were made out of either niobium or lead-plated copper. And just for fun, I dug out of that. Ah, no, come back. Dug out of the paper. Uh, ah. <laughs> OK. There we go. So those are Rabi oscillations of groups of atoms in a superconducting cavity. Uh, I think the one on the left is probably about 300 atoms, and the one on the right is probably less than 50 atoms. So that was what I did with Dan. It was fascinating. I do regret the fact that I no longer need quantum mechanics and really haven't used it for about a quarter of a century because I loved quantum mechanics, but not much call for it in mechanical engineering. So this leads into one of the first things that happened when I started working at MIT is the professor who hired me to run the labs had set up this nice experiment where you have a speaker at the top of a chamber and then two microphones. And then you can actually, if you connect the two microphones to the x and y axes of a scope, you get a nice, this is your figure. So if the two microphones are at the same height and you send in a single frequency sine wave with the speaker, you'll get y equals x, nice straight line. If then you let one of the microphones move down, ah, it's not working, my beautiful animation. <laughs> OK, so if you let one of the microphones move down, you'll go through ellipses and circles until you get to a line pointing the other direction, in which case you've moved half a wavelength. You know the frequency. You've measured half the wavelength. You can get the speed of sound. Cool, right? Fascinating. So but when I first did the experiment, it was in this plexiglass tube. So of course, what were there? There was mode structure. And since I had cavities on my brain for nearly 10 years, I was like, this is so cool. We can have the students look at the mode structure in the cavity, and they can trace out you know, how the amplitude changes as they move it down. And Professor Ian Hunter looked at me very calmly and said, no, they're engineering students. They just want to use this as a tool to measure the speed of sound. They do not want to explore the mode structure of, of sound in a cylindrical cavity. So what we did was to change it to a square cavity and fill it with sound insulating foam to try and get rid of as much of the mode structure as possible. So that was sort of my first experience to, OK, engineers do think a little differently than physicists. Physicists want to try and understand everything. And engineers, mostly, if it's something they don't understand and it's not useful, they want to make it go away. And if it is useful, they want to figure out how to use it. So. so now I'm going to jump into the main thing I'm talking about, which is the Women's Technology Program at MIT. This is a program to spark high school girls' interest in the future study of engineering and computer science. 
Our, our approach is to admit students who excel in math and science but are not already on the path to be engineering. So we get some excellent applicants who apply and say, yes, I've wanted to go to MIT and major in error astro engineering since I was in sixth grade. And we're like, that's great, do that. But we don't want you in our program because we're trying to get the girls who really don't know what they want to do, don't know about engineering, and tell them, hey, engineering is actually really fun. And if you like math and science, you might like it. So they're there for four weeks, and we have two curriculum tracks. One is electrical engineering and computer science, and the other is mechanical engineering, which is the one I'll be mostly talking about today because that's the one that I run. The program was founded in 2002. It actually has an interesting history. It was founded by a male um, EECS grad student as part of his master's thesis because he looked around him and he saw there were not enough women in the EECS department. And one could argue that physics has similar problems, although I've been encouraged by looking at the students. The gender ratio seems a lot better than it was when I was a student. So hopefully that's improving. Um, it's been directed since 2003 by Cynthia Skier, who works in the ECS department. And then in 2006, the then dean of the School of Engineering really wanted to expand the program to another department. And the next one, which had the lowest numbers of females, was mechanical engineering. At that time, I believe we actually only had one female tenured professor. She's now the department chair. We now have, I think, four or five tenured females and some more in the pipeline. But at the time, mechanical engineering was not doing very well with attracting females. Yeah. So we generate interest in engineering by a lot of hands-on classes and team-based projects. We expose them to a broad range of engineering topics which actually mechanical engineering at MIT is really easy to do because the mechanical engineering department at MIT is incredibly broad. It actually reminds me a little bit of what I think physics was in the early 1900s where it sort of covers everything and people do everything. So mechanical engineering at MIT right now is a fascinating department. And then we correct their preconceived notions about what engineers are like and what they do. We survey them before they come saying, what do you think mechanical engineers do? And the answers we get most often are bridges, which is really civil engineering or cars, but actually they do a lot of biomedical engineering. At MIT there's a lot of developing world engineering, so there's a lot of different things that you can do with mechanical engineering. We also work on increasing their confidence, so we expose them to female engineers of all ages, both students and faculty. They learn to live away from home, work in teams, and discover that they can actually understand sort of college level material. If we explain it to them well enough, they can actually get complicated concepts, so it's, it's a great experience for them. As I said before, it's a four-week program. We take in 40 students into the EECS track and 20 students into the ME track. Um, they have three weeks where they do lab classes and projects, and then the final week is a special project. So the EECS students come actually to the machine shop in the mechanical engineering department and build DC motors. That's a good electrical engineering thing, and some of them enjoy it so much that when they come to MIT, they actually become mechanical engineering majors, which is fun. And the um, Mechanical engineering students build a Rube Goldberg machine. So probably you all know what that is. It's the multiple steps, the chain reaction, something makes something else happen. They're taught by female, uh, glass is really great, female um, MIT grad students or recent graduates. They teach the classes. And then we have undergrads who live with them in the dorm and help them with their homework and do social activities with them. And then we always have guest speakers and industry tours. So the first week is statics. We've played around with the curriculum a lot. You can't teach anything in mechanical engineering until you cover basic physics mechanics. We do not give them Kleppner and Kalenko because that's an incredibly hard book that we use to study for the general exams at MIT as grad students and they give it to freshmen. So my son actually took the class and used my copy of your book. So we just do basic mechanics, not quite as complicated problems. We cover static forces, static torques, and then we can get into mechanical engineering topics, which is really what they're interested in. So we can do materials, structures, and some static fluids. And our capstone project for that week is a crane designing contest. So they work in groups of four and make cranes. And the metric is how much weight, how much mass their crane can support before it either bends a certain amount or actually tips. Unfortunately, tipping is often the failure mode. We do give them counterweights. but. So, but then to make it a little more design-oriented and real-world oriented, the winner is not the one that supports the most mass. It's the one with the largest number of mass divided by mass of crane. Because in engineering, often you want to keep your material cost down. So we, we've changed it to be that metric. 
Along with that, we do a lot of really mechanical engineering topics in creativity and design. We teach them how to do brainstorming. So they work in their groups of four on the crane building and brainstorm how to build it, try to select the proper way to do it. We also teach them drawing first by hand and then using SolidWorks, which is a CAD program. And then that, I don't know if you can tell, but that's actually a toaster. So that's a student drew up a toaster and we get it 3D printed for them so that they can take home a little souvenir. Then we do a lot of hands-on stuff. We give them a toolkit, which they can take home with them. And they spend the first night of the program taking things apart. And again, that's an opportunity to see how things are put together. We actually have them pegboard the materials up so you can look if there's common parts. We stole this activity from actually the senior design class at MIT. So we thought it would be fun for high school students to do as well. Week two. <laughs> Week two is then dynamics, so that's things that move. So we get into F equals MA, energy, momentum, and then we can do some fluid dynamics. And we also bring in circuits because it's very important for mechanical engineers to also be familiar with and not afraid of electrical engineering and circuits and coding. And we actually also teach them MATLAB, which is a commonly used simulation programming environment. Uh, the capstone project for this week is really fun. They build, they draw in SolidWorks, simulate the lift, and then build airfoils out of foam. And then we go into the large Wright Brothers wind tunnel at MIT, giant wind tunnel, and we test them. And so that's a great experience for them as well. Then they also come to my lab, the measurement and instrumentation lab, and do the experiments that the college kids do. And they found that the first year we did that, they were so excited to be doing an experiment that a college kid does. We've added a few more because I didn't have enough experiments. This one we actually stole from biological engineering. Since um, optical trapping was invented when I was a grad student, I find it so fascinating that now it's just a tool in the, in the BE lab and they use it to trap bacteria and examine their behavior and things like that. It's just really cool. And then here, again, the importance of communication. So they give oral presentations on the experiments that they did to the rest of the class and anyone else who wants to come. And then in week three, we do a lot of field trips. This is actually our visit to a company called Kiva Systems, which has a fascinating warehouse delivery robotic system. And they were actually just bought by Amazon a little over a year ago, so a very successful company. They do their own go forth and measure type experiment at an amusement park. So we give them sensors that they have to put on and measure something as they're taking a ride. And on that, they give a lightning talk, which is like a two or three minute talk. And this is a great design company in the Boston area called Continuum that has an entire room that's basically a library of materials. So whenever anyone goes somewhere, they find a cool package, they bring it back, and you can just walk in there and get inspiration. And most of the students, when we go there, they're like, I want to work there when I, after I graduate because it's a fascinating place. They then do, I apologize for my clicker. They then do poster projects. So this is a chance to do a little more simulation and calculation, not so much hands-on. And then they make nice posters and have a poster session on various topics. And then the last week is the Rube Goldberg machine. And I'm actually going to play some of a movie while I'm talking about it. So this was, of course, the Harry Potter year. We'll skip all that. <laughs> so they had Harry Potter themes. So we make them calculate what goes on in every step or estimate. So they have to look at it. They have to think about the um, energy or momentum transfer. They have to measure things if they need to. You saw there was fluids. They have to use things from materials we've taught them. Obviously, there's a lot of momentum going on. Um, this one poured me a martini at the end. <laughs> it was water, of course. But And then have one more I'll show if I can get it to the right place. So here's another one where they're using airflow to wind up a string. And we require that the machine take at least 30 seconds to run, which means they usually need some sort of slow step. The first year, we didn't require that. And the one that was really well engineered and worked great was over in about five seconds. So that was a little boring. So for that one, the slow step was melting ice. And then the final step was supposed to be to cut a banana. So they can be very creative on their final steps. So in terms of the impact, it's actually had an amazing impact on the students. Many of them say they would have never thought about doing engineering until they come to WTP. And then they come and apply to an engineering college. And actually, many of them want to and do get into MIT because they find it's a really stimulating place to be. Um, in terms of the number of alumni with known majors, so some of them ha aren't in college yet. Some of them haven't declared their major. But the ones with known majors, more than 60% are majoring in 
engineering or computer science, which is actually a really nice number. We're happy to see that. Some still go the science route. We're also happy. I've had several students who've gone through the program and say, you know, I'm glad I came, but I discovered I don't really like engineering. And that's a great outcome, too, because then their parents aren't spending huge amounts of money sending them to an engineering school, and they discover they don't like engineering. And yep, again, at MIT, we have um, a, over, typically over 50% of the alumni who apply to MIT get in, which is nice. They don't all come. Uh, and then we have almost three quarters are actually in the School of Engineering, or have been in the School of Engineering. I'm working for me this summer as an instructor as a student who was in the very first program year in 2006. She then taught as a tutor for two summers, and she's now a grad student in mechanical engineering. She's coming back to be an instructor. So, um, I don't know that I have time to read through all these, but basically they just learn that engineering is really broad. They can do a lot with it. You know, the sort of the whole field is open. They get to work with other people. They really enjoy it. And. That's, that's the whole group there, and our website is wtp.mit.edu, so if you know any girls who might be interested in engineering, point them to our website. And then I just have to thank, in particular, Cynthia Skier, who runs the program, and Britt Garbloff, who has funded the mechanical engineering program since the second year. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I was wondering, uh, maybe I missed it. Did you mention how many uh, students are in a, a given class? Does it yes. fluctuate, or how many are yeah, there? Yeah, so there's class? 40 in electrical engineering and 20 in mechanical engineering. OK, so they're, they're, these are 60 young girls. So there's 60 girls each summer. And of, the, of those, then 60% of that, of that cohort uh, go on to, to major in engineering. To major in engineering. Now, you had a pie chart also. You had a slice. Uh, for physics or for science, for science I guess. science, yes. So, so how much is that slice plus the 60% there? That slice, I think, is close to, it looks like it's over at least 20%. It looks like the two of them combined are about three quarters. Yeah, so say 75, 75, yeah. 80%. Yeah. Yeah, so that's actually, that's a very large statistic. I it mean, is. that's Well, we're, that's we're of course, picking girls who like math and science. Yeah, but still. But still, it is yeah. nice, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara, the, this program has been running for, what, six years now? Yeah. Have you noticed any difference in your applicants or the entering class? In the, you know, is the program having an effect on friends and That's the community? That's a good question, yeah. We definitely get, once we get someone from one school in, then more people come from that school. So one of, we don't really advertise much. It's mostly found through the web partly because we are now in the process of evaluating 300 applications and trying to pick 60, so we couldn't take more. But there are certain areas of the country we'd like to be in more, and so whenever we get a student from one of there, it generally spreads to their siblings. We've had several sibling pairs to friends, and once the teachers at the schools learn about us, then they point them our way, so yes. And have you had any special effort for the underprivileged students? We try. So. Mm -hmm. Um, MIT admissions, when they go out to underprivileged schools, tends to mention us. And so we try, um, it's again the normal trade-off of you have to have them with enough background and experience so they can do the curriculum. But we do want to admit them if we can. There's another program at MIT called MITES, which is Minority Introduction to Technology, Engineering and Science, which is directly aimed at minority and underprivileged. What a great program. Thank you. <laughs> um, at the University of Maryland, we have a, a, a science program called Summer Girls. And our lawyers told us we couldn't restrict it to girls anymore. Have you had any problems along those lines? <laughs> <laughs> we have not yet. I have wondered about that. We periodically get guys or parents of guys, you know, emailing us saying, are there any programs like this for guys? Because in fact, I was talking with someone about this um, last night. Guys actually need this program, too, because guys don't just go work on their cars anymore because you can't do much in your car anymore. It's all electronic and computer. So, so you know, a program like this for guys would be helpful, too. So, oddly, we only have a few guys join the Summer Girls program. I would figure, you know, what an opportunity, <laughs> but... <laughs> well, you, you still call it Summer Girls. <laughs> 
is this yeah. program international or basically for Americans? So the rules we have for acceptance is you have to be an American citizen or you can be an international citizen but going to school in the U.S. It's a funny rule. One of the main reasons we do that is MIT has incredibly restrictive limits on the number of international students it will accept. So if we accepted more international students, they would come to MIT and really want to get in and then wouldn't get in because MIT accepts about, I think, 80 international students every year. So. Okay. More questions? So let's thank Barbara again.